Matthew, the book of Matthew. I don't know that I've ever thought about some of the things that the Lord's put on my heart for this morning. It's kind of maybe a little bit unusual, but I, I guess it happened in my heart because this year especially, uh, today, Sunday, is the day after Christmas. And I want to think about a thought this morning, not necessarily the day after Christmas, but in those days after Christmas. And look in the scripture and some things the Lord has put on my heart that I hope and I pray will be a blessing. Matthew chapter number two is where we're going to begin our reading today. And I'll read these first first, uh, first 13 verses and then uh, we will... Uh, get into the message today and we'll see some other scripture in the chapter as well. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. I want you to think about that. We're, we're in the days after Christmas, but there's a lot of people in this world that are troubled. And um, the Bible said here, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And this is what I shared with the class this morning. The Pharisees, they knew the word of God. They knew what to tell him. The Bible said, and they said in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art not thou the least, art not, art not the, the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them unto Bethlehem, and said, go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, fell down and worshiped him and presented and and when they had opened their treasures they presented unto him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod they departed into their own country another way and when they were departed behold the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying arise take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. If correctly read, that's verse 1 through uh, verse number 14. Let's pray together. Father, thank you to, today for the privilege to look into your word. And God, I know that You've shared with me, our Father, some thoughts that I, I hope, I pray, will be a blessing to your people. It certainly is a thought, our Father, that is maybe not prevalent in these days, but Lord, what do we do after Christmas? What do we do in these days that follow? And I pray, Father, that as we look into the Word of God, that we would uh, find some hope, and God, that we would understand, Lord, that many things are still the same. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. I pray you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, there may be somebody here today that don't know you. God, I pray today. Lord, I pray. I pray. God, that someone yeah. would open their heart. They would know the healing power of the blood of Jesus. They would know, our Father, when they leave this place, that they're ready when they have to leave this world, that heaven will be their home. I pray now, Father, that you would help us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to give you several things today, and I 
I'll try to be as brief as I possibly can, but I, I don't know why I begin to think along these lines, like I said, except for uh, today, Sunday, the Lord's Day, being the day after the day that we set aside to celebrate the birth of our Lord. And there's some kind of unusual thoughts here, but I, I want to share them with you. There are four groups of people here that I want to bring your attention to. First, I want to bring your attention that after Christmas, Jesus has been born, there were those that were hating. You see, Herod is putting on a facade. He's acting like he wants to find the Christ child so that he might worship him. But he's actually wanting to find the Christ child so he might destroy him. I want to say this to you today. Listen to me carefully. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but we're living in a country where there are many, many people that do not believe in our Christian heritage. They do not believe in the, even the fundamentals of the foundation of our country. They're trying to change us into a Marxist nation, into a communist nation, and they hate our country. But you see, there's something they hate even worse than they hate our country. They hate our Christ. They hate this Christ child that's been born, this one that was born in a manger, this one that came to deliver his people from their sin. The word of God said there in verse number uh, three, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. What I want you to understand today is there is a group of people, there's a remnant of people that love the Lord, that love our country, that want to see our country survive for our children and for our grandchildren. There's men in this building that have went and fought for this country for our freedoms, and we don't want to just give them up, amen, because somebody thinks it ought to be a different way. But while we understand that there are people that love this Christ and love this country and love, beloved, their families and want that freedom, we need to keep in the back of our mind there are people that absolutely despise the freedom that we enjoy, absolutely despise the country that we live in, and absolutely despise this Christ child. I remember one time I was preaching in a prison, and I didn't preach a whole lot different than I am here. I, I did have more dogs saying sick them, if you know what I mean. Uh, th them fellas would preach you to death in the prison. I'm telling you what's the truth. They would absolutely preach you to death. I was preaching in one meeting, and, and this fellow was sitting on the front bench, and he would holler, come on, come on. And I was preaching my guts out, and I finally stopped in the middle of it and said, I'm coming. Give me a few minutes, would you, amen? <laughs> I'll be there directly, amen? Uh, they, they'd sit and holler, preach, preach. I stopped one time said what in the name of the Lord Jesus do you think I'm trying to do amen I'm trying to preach the word of God but I'm telling you beloved listen I was in a prison one time and the imam uh, the Muslim imam uh, after the service was over he said to me something and I'm telling you beloved you had to be careful I was working under brother Napper and I had to be careful not to get Brother Napper in trouble, not to get our ministry in trouble. But he said to me, he said, I don't know why you have to get up in there and holler like that. And I told Brother Napper when we left the prison, I said, I'm going to tell you something right now. It's the holler, and that ain't what's bothering him. It's who I'm hollering about. Hey, Amen. It's that Jesus. I told Brother Napper, I said, I could whisper his name to that man, and it would trouble him because he just don't believe he's the son of the living God. He don't believe he's the savior of the world. Amen. Amen. He don't believe he's coming again. He don't believe he was born of a virgin. And he don't believe he lived a sinless, spotless life. Uh, beloved, listen, there are people that hate this Jesus that we celebrate, amen, and celebrate his birth. There were those that were hating. But then, secondly, there were those that were honoring. Just as sure as Herod, and I, I, I'm not even sure the, uh, the Pharisees had got their hatred in high gear yet, they're going to get it in high gear later as Jesus lives and as they see that there are throngs of people following Jesus and that he speaks as one having authority, not as the scribes and not as the Pharisees. They're going to begin to get jealous and they're going to hate him. I'm not sure how bad they hate him yet, but they're probably already setting in because they see scripture being fulfilled and the prophecy being fulfilled that in truth this is the Christ child uh, that's going to be born. But there were those that were honoring. Look in uh, verse number 8. 
The Bible said he sent them to Bethlehem and go and search diligent for, for the young child. For you, and, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. You say, Pastor, you believe Herod was lying? No, I know he was lying. He had no interest in worshiping Jesus. The word of God said he wanted to destroy him. Amen. And the Bible said when they heard the king, let's look at these that are honoring the Lord. Lo, the star uh, which was saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. You say, Pastor, those that were honoring. Yes, uh, the Bible is teaching there were wise men. The Bible doesn't say there's three of them. I'm not going to fuss with you, amen. But the Bible talks about the three gifts here. That doesn't mean there was only three wise men. But they brought gifts. They brought things that a lot of times there's something trying to be brought out about the gold representing royalty. And I'm not against all that. But the, what God is trying to get across to us here, they're not bringing leftovers. They're bringing their best. Amen. They're bringing that that's valuable and they're presenting it to the Lord. Amen. Uh, they love him uh, and they want to worship him. They fall down. Uh, uh, beloved, there's people in this world that thinks he ought to fall down before us. That'll never work. Uh, we're the ones that's supposed to fall down before him. Uh, he's the one that's worthy of worship. Uh, and they're worshiping him and they're bringing their gifts. Uh, I had a blessed experience at Christmas with my grandchildren. We read the Christmas Christmas story. This time we read out of Matthew instead of out of Luke. Uh, and then Brother Michael, the Lord did put that on my heart in the phone call uh, to, to look at that, that scripture in Galatians. Uh, in the fullness of time, glory to God, right on time, here come Jesus, born of a woman. Amen. Uh, oh, hallelujah, that holy Christ child. But I told the children before I read, I said, I want you to be looking for two things. Uh, I said, I want to know what Emmanuel means. I, I ask them that question. And then I ask them about the gifts. I said, I want to know what they brought uh, uh, to Jesus. And, uh, and they, they answered the questions. Uh, I guess it was Olivia. She's sharp as a tack. She's seven years old. She said, his name means God with us. And I said, that's exactly right, honey. They didn't know before, but they listened through the reading. Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And then we, we talked, they answered the question about the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. And then I asked this question. I said, those are precious things that they brought to Jesus. I said, what is the most precious thing? Thing, youngins. Uh, I've got my youngins and my grand youngins gathered around. I said, what is the most precious thing that you could give Jesus? And Amelia raised her hand. Uh, my little four-year-old granddaughter, she said, prayer. I said, honey, that's a good thing to give Jesus. I said, but what's the most precious thing that we could give Jesus? And Olivia, Laura, raised her hand and she said, our life. <laughs> I said, honey, that's it. That's it. That's the most precious thing in the world that you could give Jesus is your life. Young people, listen to me today. Mom and dad, mamas and papas, the most precious thing that you could give Jesus is not your gold and not your silver, but your life. Amen. That's what he wants. He wants us to give him our life. I remember an illustration. I won't get it just exactly right. But I remember there was an illustration where there was an Indian and uh, he didn't have anything, Brother Chris, to give the way that other people were given in the offering. And so when the offering was over, he came up and took the offering plate and put it down on the, on the floor and he stood in it. And everybody knew, uh, he, I'm going to give him me. Amen. Can I tell you, that's what he wants this morning. He wants us to give him our life. Amen. And, uh, and to God be the glory. There were those that were hating him, but there were those that were honoring him. Now listen to this. I've never thought about this in my life. The Bible said over and over that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You think about that mother. Think about this, Sister Tanita. You think about the joy that was in Mary's heart. But I want to tell you, not only are there, there are those that uh, what was the first thing that uh, were hating and those that uh, were honoring, but there are those that are hurting. 
I want you to think about something. I've never thought, I don't know why I've never thought about it before in my life in those days after Christmas. Herod, he, he, he understands now that the wise men, so to speak, have tricked him. And so what does he do? He orders all those children. Now the word of God, history says it was the male children and that makes sense. But the word of God, if you read it there, Matthew says the children, two years and younger, to be killed. I'm telling you, while there is a mother whose heart, his heart is so full, and she's pondering in her heart as she knows she's holding the Christ child. There's mother after mother after mother. You say, well, I don't know how. Listen, I tried to study last night what I'm talking about. I tried to look it up. How many people lived in Bethlehem at that time? Some say 6,000, some say 60,000. So I'm just going to tell you, I don't know how many people lived in Bethlehem at that time. And I don't know how many babies died in Bethlehem when, when, uh, when Herod ordered them killed. But I do know this. Every precious mother and every precious father Father that lost the young and amen uh, because the Christ child had been born and because of the hatred that was in Herod's heart every precious mother was hurting amen. you say pastor I don't know what that's got to do with us listen to me we would do well as the people of God to remember it's after Christmas. There's still people that are hurting. You say, Pastor, why should we think about that? Well, if we were to think about it, we might pray about it. And if we was to pray about it, God might use us in some little way to make a difference. Michael, I don't know. I don't know how they... I mean, I know it wasn't the United States Postal Service and letters, and I know there wasn't telegrams, and, and, and I know there wasn't telephones, and I know there wasn't televisions. But I wonder, Brother Gary, when Joseph and Mary's down in Egypt, if some way they didn't get word about some of their friends in Bethlehem, now Mary's looking at her baby and thinking, because my baby lives. Others have lost their baby. These are thoughts that I've never thought about before. But I promise you, according to the word of God, Herod was so distraught that he wanted them under two years old killed. You talk about wicked, somebody say amen. amen. I've often thought about this. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how anybody could harm a youngin. You tell me something's gone way wrong if somebody could harm a youngin. And I, I, I think that God is asking us in Bible way not to forget that in those days after Christmas there are people that are hurting. You know, Brother Gail sent us a wonderful note. And boy, the young people did a great job. But you say, Pastor, you're always bragging on them. Yeah, as long as I'm living, I'm going to. They did a great job. But you know, in those days after Christmas, all those people we visited with, they're still lonely. Maybe God would put it in our hearts not to wait for a whole nother year, just to do something special. Just pick one out once in a while, amen, go through the list. Just do a little something special. You say, Pastor, what are you trying to say? How many believes that's being Christ-like? You know what Jesus did? He helped those who were hurting. Say amen. amen. He helped them. So there were those that were hating and those that were honoring, but at the same time, there were those that were hurting. In verse 13 down through 18, Herod's going to seek the young child. He arose, took the young child and the mother by night, departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. 
saying out of Egypt, have I called my son? Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two year old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the young of the wise men. Look at verse 17 and 18. You don't think they're hurting? Listen to what Jeremiah said. Then was fulfilled which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, in Ramah was there a voice heard. Lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. I'm telling you, I don't know how I've missed this all these years. But there are people who are hurting. Jesus has been born. And it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. But at the same time, there are people that are hurting. The last thing in the message I'll give you today is there are those that were hoping. You say, Pastor, where, where, do, you, where do you find that in the Word of God? Well, if you think about Simeon, when he held up, God had told him that he was not going to die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he knew that this was the deliverer. This was the one. I'll give you two things under this and I'm done. First of all, there was hope found in his name. The word of God said, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. The word of God said in another text, his name is holy. I had missed that. Just holy, that's all said. His name is holy. In another text, the word of God said, Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. You see, John said in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And then he said, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I'll tell you, there's hope that's found in his name. Turn with me to Isaiah for just a moment, would you please? Isaiah chapter number nine. I want you to think about this name, the name of Jesus. I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Before I was ever saved, I knew there was something about that name. I knew, I knew, I knew there was something about that name. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, the Bible said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. How many of y'all know him this morning? How many of y'all know he's wonderful? The Word of God said, Counselor. How many knows he's one that you can lean on when you need an answer? He is the counselor. How many know he is the mighty God? Amen. You see, that's why the Pharisees hated him. They said he made himself equal with God. He didn't make himself anything. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death. He always was God. Say amen. amen. God the Father, God the Son, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Thou art God, the mighty God, the everlasting Father the Prince of Peace. I say to you this morning, beloved, listen. If you're here today and you have peace in your heart, it's because the Prince lives there. There is no peace apart from the Prince of Peace, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. So there were those, beloved, in the days after Christmas that were hoping. They had found hope in this Christ child, in the Lord Jesus. Turn to Luke chapter 2 for just a moment. Luke chapter number 2. Not only is there hope, beloved, in his name, there's, there's hope for the nations. Listen to what the Bible said in Luke chapter number 2. The Bible said, and behold, verse 25, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, 
And the same was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Look at verse 31. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. I love verse 32. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. You say, Pastor, in the days after Christmas, there were those that were hoping. Yes, they were, there was hope that was found in his name. But there was hope even in the days after Christmas that was found for the nations. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Aren't you glad, beloved? Listen, and the glory of thy people Israel. Aren't you glad? You want to hear a Christmas verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I read an illustration last night and I thought that I would share it with you. It, it, deals, it deals with hope. I hope that it will be a blessing to you. It was a blessing to me when I read it. A number of years ago, researchers performed an experiment to see the effect that hope has on those undergoing hardship. Two sets of laboratory rats were placed in separate tubs of water. The researchers left one set in the water and found that within an hour, they had all drowned. The other rats were periodically lifted out of the water and then returned. When that happened, the second set of rats swam for over 24 hours. Why? Not because they were given a rest, but because they suddenly had hope. Those animals somehow hoped that if they could stay afloat just a little longer, someone would reach down and rescue them. It's hope that holds such power. If hope holds such power for unthinking rodents, how much greater should its effect be on our lives? I want you to know this morning, beloved, I don't know where you are, but God knows where you are. And I want you to know there's hope. There's one that can reach farther down than we can reach up. I tell you, beloved, this morning, listen, I've been faced with something this week. I'm not going to go into it. And there's times when I've lost all hope. But I'll tell you, I read another illustration that said hope is not really hope until you've lost all hope. But I'm telling you, there's a God in heaven. I'm telling you, beloved, the Bible said with God all things are possible. I'm telling you, beloved, the Bible said the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should walk soberly and righteously in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad he's redeemed us? Aren't you glad he's coming again? Aren't you glad we don't have to live another year without hope? We can know Oh, beloved, that the word of God is true. There were those after Christmas that were hating. There were those after Christmas that were honoring. There were those after Christmas, beloved, that were hurting. And there were those after Christmas that were hoping. They had that hope. I love what the songwriter said. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not claim the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Years ago, I was preaching in a jubilee meeting at Antioch Baptist Church in Bristol. 
They called preachers from the floor. So you never knew when you might get called on. For sure, if you would, get called on. But that morning, God had woke me up early in the morning and given me a message out of the book of Psalms where the Bible said, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Beloved, I'll tell you something. There's somebody puffing at us. Amen. He walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He wants your life. He wants your family. He wants your children. He wants our church. He wants our country. He would love nothing more than to see our country deny this Christ that we love. Amen. Amen. And beloved, in many ways we already are. When you have leadership in a country putting their stamp of approval on same-sex marriage, you're denying the only Lord God, say amen, amen, that loved us and gave himself for us. Beloved, I went up that morning to preach. They called me to preach. And I asked several people. I asked my wife. I asked others. I tried to look it up. And I had, I mean, if I talked to five different people, I had five different versions of the three little pigs. And so I just made up my own. And I said, there was this little pig over here and the big bad wolf of the world, the big bad wolf of the devil, and the big bad wolf of the flesh said, I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow your house down. And about the time the big bad wolf huffed and puffed and blowed, I had him run out the back door and he run over to his brother's house. And uh, then that big bad wolf came to that other house. He blew that house down right off the foundation. And I had him over here, the big bad wolf of the world and the flesh and the devil said, I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow your house down. And I had them run out the back door and they run over to their brother's house and the big bad wolf blowed the house down. That third one, they went over there and they said, I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow your house down. The big bad wolf of the world, the big bad wolf of the devil, the big bad wolf of the flesh said, "Woo!" and nothing happened. I said, they tried again. Woo! And nothing happened. I said, them big bad wolves was listening. They said, wait a minute, I hear something. And they were standing on the inside singing, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Brother Larry, that place come unglued that morning. Oh, uh, Brother Craig uh, Edwards, he got up that morning. He said, I've shouted at weddings. I've shouted at funerals. He said, I've even shouted at a business meeting. But I've never shouted over the three little pigs till this morning. I'm telling you, beloved, there's help. There's help for those that will put their trust in Christ. We don't have to live without hope. Simeon said, here he is. The hope of Israel, a light to lighten the Gentiles. I don't know about you this morning, but I thank God for Christmas. I thank God for the days after Christmas. You say, Pastor, why? Because the one I serve is the same yesterday and today and forever. I love him. You say, Pastor, you bragging? Yep, I love him because he first loved me. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Thank you for praying. Thank you this morning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the message, for the strength, our Lord, in this body to deliver it. I pray, dear Father, this morning, you speak to that heart. Lord, I know the enemy. I know him well enough to know that he's a liar. And I believe one of his greatest lies is there's no hope. God, you're still on the throne. You're still doing the impossible. 
With men, things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It's my prayer this morning, Father, that you take the message down deep into hearts. Help folks today to understand and to know, God, there is hope. They can honor you, Lord, with their lives. I pray, help us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Please, no one looking around. 